Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Olivia Carvalho, and I'm the Urban Engagement and Events Coordinator for Birds Canada. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Window Strikes, the webinar on window collisions uh, with Brian and Sienna. This webinar is presented by Birds Canada as part of the Toronto Bird Celebration um, through the development of Brian and Sienna and their wonderful knowledge that they're excited to share with you tonight. The Toronto Bird Celebration is a month-long festival of events that celebrates the return of birds, spring migration, all throughout the greater Toronto area uh, and through the magic of online. So we're excited to be reaching you tonight. The Toronto Bird Celebration would not be possible without the generous support of Birds Canada, uh, TD Friends of the Environment, Armstrong Bird Food, Koa Optics, uh, and Patterson Outdoor Advertising. And I will invite you to use the Q&A function uh, throughout the duration of this talk, but know that there will be time for uh, a live Q&A at the end where you're able to raise your hand and uh, verbalize a question if that's your preferred method. Um, just to know that this recording will be shared afterwards and will be available on the Toronto Bird Celebration YouTube. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Brian and Sienna to get us underway. Well, um, hello everyone and welcome um, to this webinar. Thank you for joining at this hour. I know this time is probably when everyone's getting their dinners, but yeah, thank you for being here and thank you for Olivia for giving us this opportunity. So you may or may not know me from last Friday's Window Strike outing. So I'm Brian and I'm an ecology undergrad at U of T and a recent resident to downtown Toronto. So throughout the two to three years I've stayed in downtown, I've noticed a number of bird window collision incidents. And I, I had sent a couple birds to um, to rehab centers and that had me thinking, how does window strikes continue to happen on such a regular basis? And what can be done to uh, prevent it from uh, happening ever again? And yeah, I'm here to reflect on what I've learned on that matter and ask the important questions regarding uh, these winter strikes incidents, uh, which will be answered by Sienna. Sienna, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Hi, I'm a Toronto Bird Celebration Youth Ambassador. I'm also a former co-op student and current volunteer with the Fatal Light Awareness Program, FLAP Canada. presenting. Oops. So today we are going to take a bird's eye view and reflect on bird building collisions. Sorry. Uh, sorry, I was just, I was not unmuted. Uh, yeah, just a disclaimer before we get started, this presentation uh, is about window strikes and therefore will have photos of dead birds. So if you are, um, if you are, uh, if you're uncomfortable with it, feel free to switch off your screens and just listen. Yeah. So who is Flap Canada? Flap Canada is a registered charity celebrating its 30th year of dealing with bird window collisions. Through working with politicians, legislative bodies to, to establish policies, guidelines, and standards to make buildings bird safe, advocacy and education about bird window collisions, data collection and analysis of bird window collisions, and rescuing and sending window collision victims to rehab. Some of our programs include Bird Safe, which is the commercial and corporate building risk assessment, design, education, and window treatment, the Global Bird Collision Mapper, which all FLAP volunteers use to report observed window collisions. We currently have around 90,000 entries in the mapper from 30 years of data collection. All data is publicly available and everyone is encouraged to use this site to report a collision when they see one. We also have the Global Bird Rescue, which takes place every fall and teams around the world go out to find birds that have collided with windows. We also have Birds in Your Hood, which is an in-school experience teaching children about birds, their importance, and educating kids about window collisions. Part of the work FLAP does is on-street patrols in high collision centers such as downtown Toronto. Injured birds are contained, given homeopathic remedies, and are either released or sent to rehab. Dead birds are collected and frozen for our annual bird layout to raise awareness about window strikes. FLAP's advocacy work, backed up by data collection, 
has helped to establish bird-friendly municipal guidelines for the City of Toronto, which has in turn paved the way for other municipalities to establish similar policies. So when do winter strikes usually happen? Well, it usually happens during bird migration season, namely spring and fall. And right now we are approaching the end of spring migration, but there's still some birds passing through and therefore potentially hitting windows. So that's something to look out for. But how do birds migrate in the first place? Well, migratory birds rely on the location of the setting sun, the Earth's magnetic field, uh, astrological signs, and position, and topo topological features such as green corridors, land masses, shorelines to find the way and migrate through the continents. But how specifically through uh, GTA? How do birds migrate specifically through the Greater Toronto Area? Well, just like any other uh, urban area in North America, uh, the GTA is situated on migratory flight paths. And we are currently located in between two major flyways, the Atlantic and Central American Flyway. And therefore we have a fairly diverse bird species count with both prairie and boreal migratory species being recorded here. And yeah, the birds that use these flyways migrate all the way from and to North and South America, reaching as far north as Greenland and Northern Canada, and as far south as Chile and Argentina. Well, why do we care about birds? Why are birds important? And why do we care about them? Well, although I believe most people here would agree they are of significance since most of us here are bird lovers uh, to a certain extent, if not, get out. Oh, just kidding, of course, yeah. But uh, on an ecological level, uh, birds are a part of, uh, of ecosystems. They control insect population and they feed on all sorts of bugs, including species we may find harmful, such as mosquitoes and ticks. Some birds are pollinators, like the hummingbird we have here. Um, and they often pick up and distribute pollen as they consume nectar from flowers and thus fertilizing uh, surrounding plants to help make fruit. And of course, when we speak of fruit, birds are also fruit eaters and they play an important role in dispersing the seeds in the process. They carry seeds to wherever they fly and spread the seeds when they need to poop, which supports the plant dispersal and plant diversity across the environment. Birds are, uh, uh, birds are also uh, praised to other animals, including other birds like the American cashew we have here, uh, supporting the survival of other animal species. And last but not least, we as bird lovers can't go birding without birds. And in a world without birds, not only will our hobby of bird watching and appreciation disappear, but ecosystems would collapse with it. And since we are a part of uh, ecosystem and the environment, our society can also crumble as we also rely on ecological stability for our survival, such as agriculture. Without birds, insect population can skyrocket and detriment crop harvest, not to mention the economic values in tourism that birds can generate. And therefore, birds also contribute to our societal stability. Back to the matter of window strikes. How often does winter strike occur? Uh, winter strike is actually the second highest cause of death of birds right after cats. And in North America alone, over 1 billion birds die, of, uh, die from winter strike annually with 31.68 deaths per second and 47,520 deaths during this presentation on average. And in Toronto, there are about 1,500,000 registered Toronto structures with one to 10 bird deaths per structure per year, which results in a conservative estimate of 15 million bird deaths in Toronto annually. And in 100 million bird deaths from winter collisions equals to 333 times the number of birds that died in the 1989 Exxon Valdez oil spell. Among all bird window, uh, all window collision incidents, 44% uh, occur in residential buildings, 56% in low to mid rises and less than 1% in high rises, which will equate to around um, uh, 408 million in residentials, uh, 726 million in low to mid rise and 1.7 million in high rises. So you may ask, why do most of these collisions occur in low-rise and residential buildings? Well, 
it's because these buildings are at tree canopy le uh, level and often have more green space around them compared to something like a metropolitan high rise areas, thus resulting in more window strikes. So this is a picture of Black Canada's 30th annual layout. The bird in the middle is our largest bird, the wild turkey. The smallest bird flop has found is the ruby-throated hummingbird. Since 1993, CLAP has recorded 100,000 birds from 176 species of birds. Some significant species FLAP volunteers have found include yellow rail, green heron, boreal chickadee, Louisiana water thrush, and short-eared owl. So what kind of birds fall victim to window strikes? All bird species are vulnerable to, to window collisions. Some of our most common species include the Nashville warbler, the oven bird, white-throated sparrow, golden crown kinglet, ruby-throated hummingbird, brown creepers, dark-out juncos, hermit thrushes, common yellow-throats, and black-capped chickadees. Threatened species that FLAP has found, which are federally recognized, include the Canada warbler, barn swallow, eastern whippoorwill, and wood thrush. It is such a shame to know that so many species include species at risk in Ontario and other birds such as owls and even turkeys were victims of window collisions, which begs the question of how do window strikes occur in the first place? Well, at nighttime, lights from windows or the city's light pollution attract and confuse migratory birds as they rely on astrological positions to geolocate themselves and find their way as they're migrating through urban areas. They can exhaust themselves and, by getting distracted and drawn into the lights at night in the city, um, these, the, the city areas. And at times they are, yeah, they're lured into these lights and from the windows and thus colliding into them. Birds also collide during the daytime since they cannot see glass at all. And glass is everywhere in our homes, condos, cottages, bus shelters, vehicles, highway barriers, workplaces, educational buildings, you name it. And windows are of course transparent and birds will try to fly into, uh, try to fly into plants in windows or they will try to fly through windows where they see a uh, greenery um, opposite side of the window. And for instance, the glass corner walls, um, the uh, corner walls and the railings are a good example of the transparent qualities of the glass, which contribute to bird window strikes. Windows are also reflective. Uh, greenery and or the sky is reflected into the uh, on windows in many commercial or like residential structures. Birds mistake them as actual the actual sky or greenery and thus hitting windows. In daytime, uh, daytime collision is much worse than nighttime collision, and window collision in itself actually happens more often than we think. Scavengers such as rats, squirrels, cats, raccoons, gulls often eat window collision victims as they're often too stun stunned and vulnerable to predation. Then how should we prevent future window strikes? Well, after all, all bird uh, migratory birds and species at risk are federally and provincially protected. We are potentially liable and could be charged if a bird dies or is injured by our windows. So to prevent window strikes, bird deterrent technology should be applied um, to windows. Most, but not all, window strikes can be prevented by a two by four inch marker spacing on the windows. Uh, but Flat Canada believes that two by, a two by two inch or five centimeter by uh, five centimeter is more effective in preventing even the smallest of birds such as hummingbirds and kinglets from colliding into windows. With the proper contrast and density, birds will be able to tell that they cannot fly in between these markers as they don't have enough wing space and thus not fly into the windows themselves. Well, off the wi uh, these windows here have the right density, but not all of them show the right contrast. So we can see the first window on the left, it's a dark and dark contrast. You can see you can't really actually separate the markers from, uh, from the window itself. So that's a poor example in terms of getting the right contrast. And here we have a dark on light contrast. At least, uh, at least right now, we could uh, in, uh, we could uh, very much see the marker 
uh, on the uh, on the windows, and and that is a correct contrast. And with this window, it's similar to the most leftmost window. Again, not enough contrast. It's a light on light background, so it's not the best. And with this new window here, um, it's a light on dark contrast, meaning that you can also see the markers from uh, on a uh, see the light colored markers on this dark window here. And the last window here is actually the most effective since it counteracts with all types of lighting and with, um, yeah, with different shades of the uh, glass color. So yeah, this, uh, this will be the most effective uh, in terms of contrast and density uh, of the marker placement. And as much as we try to stop window strikes, not all seemingly function, uh, function, uh, functional deterrent applications actually help stop window strikes. Like this fake owl statue right here, it does not scare birds at all. You can see the crow is just standing right on top of it. And these bird decals um, actually is functional uh, when placed on windows, but they have to be placed in the right density. Right here with only one single bird decal is too low for density and it would not be functional uh, would not be functional for uh, for birds uh, to prevent them from colliding to windows and this window right here with the uh, uh, with enough of these decals birds would be able to see that this window as a barrier it is also important to note that markers are most effective when placed on the first surface of the window as this is where they are will be most visible so it would be the surface where it's facing the outside. And as we can see here, without putting the markers on the outer surface of the windows, the markers cannot counteract with the uh, reflectiveness of the window on the left, and therefore the markers should be placed outside like the window on the right. And here are the types of functional deterrent tax that you can apply for your windows. So we have window films, which is basically a whole window sticker. We have frittings, which is textured glass. Uh, we have digital printing and etching, which is just stained or scratch glass. Something like ceramic ink. We also have painting and silk screening. You can also use more cost-efficient applications such as uh, these feather-friendly DIY tapes or use uh, soap and tempura uh, paint. Yeah, while these, uh, while this isn't as effective as all the uh, window, uh, window treatments we've mentioned uh, uh, earlier, the least you could do is not to wash your windows and turn off your lights at night. Remember, whatever product you apply, having the correct density and contrast is key uh, for effective window collision prevention. And these are the things you could do for your living space. For commercial buildings, high rises and legislative buildings, for collision incidents, we should contact the responsive personnel, such as your building management, about your concerns. You can educate them about your uh, when, uh, about window strikes and what can be done to prevent it, and talk uh, talk about the situation with other members of the community, other building users, and try and make some noise. Uh, you can also consult the uh, the Flat Canada list of recommendations, such as migration alerts to reduce light pollution. Uh, That uh, bird deterrent tech application. Any question? Okay, Brian, so you... Brian, you cut out there. Would you mind repeating that last bit? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, of course. Um, um, is anyone hearing me? Hearing me right now? This is all good. I think so. Okay. So. I was just saying that uh, things when we encounter window strikes, we should contact the responsible personnel, someone like the uh, building management, 
and we can try and educate uh, educate about winter strikes and uh, and tell them about how to prevent it. And also, we could talk talk about winter strikes with other members of the community, uh, other building users, and try to make some noise. And yeah, and if you have any more questions, you can always cons uh, you can always consult the flat Canada's list of recommendations, such as the uh, mig uh, migration alert to reduce light pollution, and a uh, bird deterrent tech uh, uh, application companies such as Feather Friendly. And of course, you could uh, contact FLAC directly if you have any questions on how to approach and work with building management. So what do you do when you encounter a bird that's hit a window? If possible, take a picture of the bird, whether it's alive or dead, and report the collision on the global bird collision mapper. If the bird flies away, there's nothing much you can do for it, though most birds that hit windows will eventually die even if they fly away and they have internal injuries, such as hemorrhaging or brain damage. If the bird is alive, you are not sure if it is dead or alive, or it is a hummingbird. Get someone to guard the bird while you get an unwaxed paper bag or box. Contain it by throwing a towel over it and gently scooping it up and placing it in the container. Put the bird in a dark and quiet environment. Do not give it any food or water and do not poke air holes as cardboard and paper are both breathable materials. From there, contact your local wildlife rehab center, which in the GTA is the Toronto Wildlife Center. If they tell you to bring the bird there and you are unable to do so, you can contact the Ontario Wildlife Transport Facebook group. They require that the bird has a placement at a rehab center and it is contained before they can arrange transport. If the bird is dead, in good condition, and you are able to bring it to a member of FLAP Canada or another window collision organization within 24 hours, we will take the bird. If the bird is in poor condition, such as rotting or being eaten by ants, then you should dispose of it according to your municipal guidelines. If you find a large live bird, like a raptor, you should call your local wildlife rehab center, such as the Toronto Wildlife Center, or Flat Canada directly for guidance. When in doubt about any of these steps, feel free to contact Flat Canada using their migration hotline from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. during weekdays in migration season and on the weekends as well. If you're interested in being part of Flat Canada, we are always accepting new volunteers. There are positions for people of all backgrounds and skill sets, such as drivers, bird rescue and building monitoring, public outreach and education, fundraising, research and data, photography and videography, IT, writing for articles, grants, etc., web development, building risk assessments, the board of directors, social media engagement, and our phone hotline. We would like to thank everyone involved in FLAP and beyond. Volunteers, like our patrollers, drivers, social media ambassadors, writers, and everyone else, corporate members such as concierges, security, cleaners, gardeners, and property managers, the Toronto Wildlife Centre staff and volunteers, the Royal Ontario Museum and Gizagin Healing for taking the dead birds and giving them a new purpose, Feather Friendly for its groundbreaking global work in window treatment technology, the politicians that have worked with FLAP to develop policies and guidelines, and of course the people like you that came to learn about this, to, that stopped to pick up window collision victims and care about our feathered friends. Together we can make every bird count. And now we'd like to open it up for questions. If you got any questions, you could type them in the chat or um, I can help you unmute, to, uh, unmute and help you ask questions. Let's see, we have a question in the chat. So what are some uh, collision organizations in Toronto or near Toronto? Do you need a permit to pick up dead birds and take them to these organizations? Okay, so for the permit, regarding the permit question, if you are able to get the dead bird to a member of said organizations within 24 hours, you do not need a permit. If you are holding the bird for over 24 hours, dead or alive, you do need a permit. So all flat volunteers and other window collision organizations also ha all have permits issued by the federal government. And 
other window collisions in Ontario near Toronto. Flat would probably be the biggest one. There's also Bird Safe Guelph. It's probably the other most significant one. We also have another question. Okay. Is it dangerous to pick up a bird dead or alive? So it depends on the species too. If you have a large raptor, we would recommend just directly calling an authority on bird containment, such as the Toronto Wildlife Center, in order to contain the bird, like how to safely approach it and such. And if you're unable to safely contain a bird, we always say that personal safety comes first. So if you feel like you're going to be putting yourself in an unsafe situation, we'd always say that just refrain from containing a bird in general. But with avian flu, the birds' populations that are most significantly affected have been waterfowl and raptors. So most of the birds that you find that have hit windows are not waterfowl or raptors. So generally speaking, it's safe to pick up birds. And yeah, with like someone like me, I've also um, handled birds myself a little. So um, if it's a small enough bird, um, if you have enough um, if you know, know about the process, especially if you call um, something like Toronto Wildlife Center, they usually um, go through a go through a procedure with you and talk you uh, talk you through how to uh, capture the birds. So it's usually not dangerous in terms of the bird safety and your safety, unless again it's something of a, a large bird or a waterfowl, and that might be a different case. Yeah. Here's another uh, one more question. What is your most or one of the most memorable birds that you have found? Brian, do you want to do this one first? Uh, yeah, of do? course. Um, um, actually, this spring I um uh, I found a northern flicker, um, a northern flicker. It was I think was shown the PowerPoint for a moment. Um, yeah, I picked up a northern flicker from around Oscar Hall area. It was. I thought it would hit a window. It was sitting still beneath this um, window strike hotspot. And yeah, I just went in and picked it up and put it in a box. And I was, and yeah, I took it to the uh, Toronto Wildlife Center. On my way there, this flicker was not being quiet at all. And it was constantly pecking on the box all the way, uh, all the way from Osgoode Hall to like down to a part where the Toronto Wildlife Center is. And yeah, it, it even, managed to make a hole in the box and poked its bill out and yeah it was and it even like reached its tongue out and was like flickering and li licking the air or something it was one of the craziest experience i had with um a window struck bird but yeah that was probably one of the most memorable experience because there was a lot of stares when people were looking at me with uh with a box that's making a lot of noise yeah how about you sienna um, I'd probably have to say I picked up two kinglets last fall, and since I was in high school, I put the birds in my locker, and then they were making a lot of noise. I had to call someone from Flap to come pick it up, and then the principal called me down, asking if there's live stuff in my locker, and <laughs> point is, I thought the kinglet wasn't going to make it, and he ended up being released, which was absolutely amazing. and. Yeah, the, I didn't get in trouble with the principal, which was also amazing. <laughs> well, at least both of you are fine now. It would be problematic if you get charged. <laughs> well, I, if you get like a paper or, or if you get a, um, yeah, if you get something like a detention for it, <laughs> that would be horrible. After all, you're trying to save a bird. You're trying to save a life. And yeah, I think that should be appreciated. Uh, yeah, there's one question in the question and answer section we've missed. Sorry for, for the wait. What can you do to ensure that when placing bird feeders and houses, you, you're not putting birds at an elevated risk for window strikes by bringing them into your yard? Is it just a matter of applying the window treatments you've discussed? Or should we also consider placing feeders uh, or, or bird houses at a certain distance from windows? Okay, so... 
generally speaking, with window treatment, um, the placement of feeders isn't too much of an issue. But if your windows are untreated, we'd recommend, even with treated windows too, we recommend either putting the windows really close, sorry, the feeders really close to the windows, so around half a meter distance from the feeder and the window, just so birds don't get enough momentum between flying from the feeder to the window to hurt themselves, or placing it around 10 meters away from the window. So that way they're far enough that hmm. they okay. don't fly into it. And I think we missed one in the Q&A. Yeah, yeah, I was about to say that. Uh, yeah, so the question was, how can we pick up an injured bird if it, it keeps struggling? Okay, so if you, most flat volunteers use a net, so if you're, for instance, using a towel, I would rec probably recommend, depending on the species, just gently holding it. If you have the towel over it, the bird's not going to be able to see very well might not be able to get out and you can place it in banders grip which is just the head between head in between your fingers holding it gently place it in a container you can also just put a box over it directly if it's there and then just kind of slide something under it and then contain it that way too yeah also um when containing a bird in a box remember the box has to have a lid um so you could of course, uh, close it up. And also the, the lid of the box can be also used to like slide the bird in. That's what I did with the flicker situation. So yeah. I think we missed one. How can we purchase materials for residential windows? So one of the popular and one of the leading window treatment companies is Feather Friendly. They make the DIY tape. If that's the particular product you were thinking of, you can find that in some, some local bird stores, like nature stores do have it, but you can also just go to their website, featherfriendly.ca, and then you can find the DIY tape there and order it from there as well. Any more questions to send in? And yes, Lana, I did meet you at Tommy Tom's Park. One more question. Is it applied on the outside or inside the window? So it the uh, in terms of the markers, it should be uh, applied on the outside of the window, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the but only exception would be if you're treating a transparent railing, in which case you could also do that on the inside of the railing because it's transparent. Because for transparent railings, we'd recommend using darker markers because it's usually on a lighter background. So that would be the only case where you put it on the inside, but that's not really a window. No problem. Any more questions? We can continue. Stuff some time here. Yeah. Here is one question. So if you see a dazed bird near a window but didn't see the strike happening, should you assume a strike or leave the bird alone? Okay, so if you see a dazed bird near a window, the chances are it did hit a window. If you happen to see a cat nearby, I mean, it could have been a cat, but you can always, I would still recommend containing the bird. Also, I would check to see if it's a baby bird. So the best steps, if you do find a bird, you're not sure why it's stunned. Would, I would recommend containing it and contacting your local wildlife rehab center. And they can give you the next steps on what to do from there. 
Yeah, and also just additional note in terms of uh, baby birds. Um, from what I know, Toronto Wildlife Center, at least this would be one of the closest uh, rehab, wildlife rehab centers in Toronto. Um, they won't be accepting uh, fledgling or baby birds during this particular season, mainly because there's just a high volume of, of them. But yeah, that, that's just one note to um, just a side note. And also, if you ever see an injured, uh, injured uh, wild animal, it's always better to call a rehab center as well. I mean, just, of course, they're alive and it's worth saving. So, yeah. We have another question in the chat, I think. Which species have you found most in your experience? Yeah, that's a question for you then. Okay, so I've been only doing this for three years. So I would, so from what I've seen in the past three years, mostly golden crown kinglets. This is for me personally, mostly golden crown kinglets, white throated sparrows, and thrushes probably be the top three. Um, flap as a whole, as, as we've already mentioned in the presentation. Kinglets, white-throated sparrows, oven birds. Those are some of the top species that we've found. I mean, this spring I had quite a few ground creepers, but also it's really all random. It, it just, there's certain species that we do find higher numbers. Oh yeah. Um, uh, so someone asked, is it possible to receive the flow chart which you presented of what to do when you come uh, when you come across a bird which has struck a window? Um, let's see. I will yeah. find the photo and I could send it into the chat. Um, is uh, is uh, is it okay, Olivia? If I just send the photo into the chat. Yeah, and I'm going to be sending it an email afterwards once the recording is up. So I'm happy to attach it there as okay. well if, if you're not able to download it from the chat. Yeah, okay. Uh, I will try and download it first then. If not, yeah, I'll, I'll send it via the email then. Right. Yeah, that also works. Yeah. Um, someone asked, if we deliver a dead bird to flap, do we have to drive there ourselves or does someone drive over to pick them up? Okay, so... If you want to deliver a dead bird to flap, I would recommend calling first. And from there, you can arrange to see if it's feasible to get the bird there. If it's not feasible, you don't have to kill yourself over it. It's, I mean, the bird is already dead. But, and yeah, depending on your situation, someone might drive to pick up the bird. Usually we don't drive to pick up birds, but Sometimes if someone happens to be in the area, that might be the case. For live birds, pickup options, if you are in downtown, our office is downtown. So we would be able to probably meet with you downtown to pick up a bird. And then, because we have our own system for getting birds to the wildlife center. If you're not in downtown, your best option would probably be Ontario Wildlife Transport. We have one more question, I think. How do you deal with the heartbreak in finding so many birds? Okay, so I guess I'll take this one. All right, so usually uh, there's a couple, we, we have a group chat for our downtown group. So I just usually talk to them about it. Also our annual layout, it's a really good way to send them off and feels like we're giving their deaths, a step, you know, their deaths have a purpose with our annual layout. So that also helps as well. For live birds, the rare chances I do get a release of bird, that also really helps because I'm seeing the bird going back to what it's normally supposed to be doing. And yeah. 
and knowing that every bird counts and they contribute to uh, to uh, further raise awareness and help contribute as a part of data and yeah, use that data to stop future birds from hitting windows, especially in a in this current scene where bird population is on is in the decline. Yeah. Okay, it looks like we have a slow of questions. We've been able to answer all of them here tonight. Uh, so I'll just take this opportunity to point everybody towards the chat. Um, there is a link to a survey in there if you let us know about this event or any of the other Toronto Bird Celebration events that you have attended. Uh, you can be entered to win a prize from Birds Canada, and the deadline for that is June 12th. So um, do it while it's fresh, but you've got a little bit of time. Um, and with that, I'll leave Brian and Sienna to say any closing remarks, and I'll just thank everyone for coming tonight, but also Brian and Sienna for sharing your expertise uh, and continuing to help support the conservation of wild birds in Canada and rehabbing birds uh, in urban environments. So thank you both so much. Thank you. Uh, regarding the flowchart situation, uh, we might have to send it through the email, um, the email later, or... Yeah. Sienna could help out with the with sending yeah. the photo because I wasn't able to share it onto the chat. But yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Um, yeah, it was nice meeting you all. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity as well, uh, Olivia, uh, for us to uh, talk about witness rights. Thank you both. Have a wonderful night. Yeah, have a wonderful night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.